before coming, I was actually very excited. I was going to take a picture in front of the barn that said hope on top, but <laughs> hope, yeah, we'll, we'll have to get it back up. But uh, thank you for having me. I believe I am the last thing between you all and lunch. So I will do my best to be interesting and at least entertaining, which should not be so hard because I am going to talk about crypto. Um, and, and yeah, you're all laughing because as you probably know, it's been going through a bit of a rough time lately. But that's actually the subject of my talk and really what it means about change, whether it's personal change, um, societal change. And someone asked me last night when I told them what I'm talking about, she said, are you a crypto bro? And I said, God, no. But I am a believer. And despite everything that's happened in my world in the past uh, year or two, uh, my conviction is strong. And in some ways, it's been strengthened by all the chaos. So I'm going to talk about why and what my background is and how these are all related. Um, so first, to begin with, um, <coughs> So about me, um, I have been working professionally in the crypto industry for the past six years. I'm the explainer in chief. I joke with my students that I have been confused about blockchain for almost a decade, so they don't have to be. <laughs> I've written some books on the topic, a bunch of articles and whatnot. Um, but before, and I, and I teach at the university, but before my crypto career, I was a personal trainer. And uh, I worked in a physical therapy office, and I specialized in working, training people with special needs. That's actually my mother, always my best client. <laughs> but the fact that I was a trainer usually surprises people, because it has nothing to do with I did, what I did before or after professionally. But that was kind of a point, in that I needed a reset and to do uh, something that was completely different. And I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about biology. But I learned even more in working with some clients over the course of years about psychology. And I learned that the hardest thing for anyone to do is to change their mind about something, particularly when that something is ourselves. So going back even further, the time before when I was a trainer was a very confusing period in my life, because I did not know what I wanted to do with myself professionally. So I decided to do many things. Uh, I was a video producer, an animator, a uh, concert director, an economic pundit of sorts. Uh, and this was a very, it was a fun time, but it was a very anxiety riddle time for me, in part because I lived in New York, a place where the second or sometimes the first question somebody asks you is, what do you do for a living? And I never had a straight answer. But despite the anxiety, I also learned a lot. And the most important thing that I learned was to muddle. And muddling to me is the decision to move forward even when you don't know where you're going. And it sounds passive, but it's actually the most active thing you can do if you decide to do even when you don't know what to do. And if you can get comfortable with it, I learned that it's kind of a superpower because it becomes like the solution to all of life's problems. So uh, Jillian was up here earlier today. She was talking about when she changed careers and that moment when she didn't know what she wanted to do, but she just knew what she didn't want to do. Right? And if you find yourself in that situation, the best thing to do is to muddle, right? or even creatively. I'm a writer. I'm sure many of you are. A lot of times you have this problem. You don't know what to write or how to write it. The only thing that there is to do is to put pen to paper and muddle. And modeling is, is almost, uh, it is to me actually the solution to one of life's biggest traps. And it's a trap that we set for ourselves when we're very young. And we tell ourselves a story of how life is supposed to be. And some of us are lucky and life actually pans out that way. Right? But for most of us, it's not so easy. And when we hit an obstacle, usually the solution is like, oh, well, that didn't work out. I just need a new story. But that's scary, particularly because we don't want to muddle. We don't want to go through that messy period in between where you explore what are the possibilities, what am I supposed to actually do. So instead, what we end up doing is we suffer and we try to contort ourselves in every fit way to fit that original story. And when I was growing up, high school and college, the story that I told myself was that I really wanted to work in finance. I wanted to be a trader. And it took me 10 years to be able to admit to myself that I sucked at being a trader. 
And then it took me five years of muddling to realize that this was actually a good thing and maybe a great thing. Which brings me, you're all wondering, to crypto. So I was introduced to Bitcoin in 2013 by a friend who asked me to help her buy some. And I had little interest, uh, but this was during my modeling period. So I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Something else to do. And I opened up an account for her on an exchange, and I bought some coins, and I was not impressed. Because this part of the process was just like all the other investment things I had done in the career that I had left behind. Then I decided to transfer those coins to a wallet I had installed in my computer, and I was blown away. And I quickly developed this instinctual feeling that something about what I had just experienced was eventually going to change everything. You know, the world of money and finance, but beyond. And I could spend hours trying to explain to you why I felt that way, but I think it would be easier to demonstrate. So this here is my copy of Nirvana's Nevermind CD. It's a special CD to me because it's the first CD I got when my family immigrated to America when I was a kid. Now, let's say that I wanted to share this CD with a friend, right? So I'm going to lend it to them. Will you be my friend? I'll be the friend. There we go. So the one thing we can all agree on is that I don't have the music anymore. Right? So in economics, we call this scarcity. And it's a pretty basic requirement for things having value. In fact, the scarcity of physical objects has been an organizing principle of society forever. But of course, today, most of us don't listen to CDs anymore. Right? We listen to digital music. So let's say I had the same songs on my phone as files, MP3s. And I wanted to share them, so I emailed them to my friend. Who has the music now? We both do, right? And that's a problem. So I was in college when Napster came out, and it was awesome. Now we're going to the record store to buy music, thousands of songs at your fingertips. But it wasn't so awesome for the musicians, because in fact, record sales fell by over 50% in those years. And eventually, they would rebound because of the popularity of streaming. But now a lot of the revenues goes to the streaming services. And I call this the great digital compromise. Right? It's like we've gained a lot of convenience as the world moved online in the past 20 years. But we've surrendered things that are important to us, like value and control. And some version of this has impacted almost every industry in that time. Um, so that's the trade-off. And that's the version of the world that most people understand. And nowhere has this been more true than money. So say what you will about cash. I know it's increasingly out of fashion. But cash always had an elegance to it. It's private, meaning nobody knows how much money I have in my wallet. It's free. There are no fees in paying somebody else. And it's universal. Like that dollar bill is as accessible to the wealthiest citizen as it is to a poor migrant. But cash has always had its drawbacks. You wouldn't want to buy your house in cash. And it certainly doesn't work online. So today, we all rely on a handful of banks and payment providers and intermediaries for most of our lives. And this is convenient, but we've made some pretty serious trade-offs. Right? Like, it's not private anymore. In fact, if anybody who worries about social media and surveillance capitalism, think about what your credit card company knows about you. It's not free, there are always fees involved, and it's certainly universal. There are billions of people all over the world who do not get access to that system, and most of them are poor or brown or otherwise underprivileged. But the problem of the compromise is in some ways even more fundamental than that. One of the other CDs that I have at home is by the great hip hop group, the Wu-Tang Clan, featuring the hit song Cream, which, what does Cream stand for? Anybody remember? Cash rules everything around me. But I suppose a more contemporary version of that song would be Apple Pay rules everything around me. <laughs> and it doesn't have quite the same ring to it. <laughs> in fact, it's pretty dystopian. Right? Like the world's largest company now in charge of our money and our music and our pictures and our data. And mind you, I have nothing against Apple. I love Apple products. But what blew me away about Bitcoin from that first transaction was in some ways it was the best of both worlds. The conveniences of digital real-time transactions all about the world, but a sense of control that we'd otherwise lost. 
And I knew this even back then because I was terrified. If you know anything about crypto, you know if you make a mistake or you get hacked, you can lose your coins, your money, and there's no way to get them back. And people always treat this like it's some kind of a flaw. Right? But to me, it's like, well, it's always been true for the cash in my wallet or a diamond earring or even my Nirvana CD. In fact, I was a bit nervous when I was packing it to bring with me on this trip because it's not worth a lot of money. But it's very valuable to me because it has nostalgia to it. And I wonder, would a 30-year younger version of me feel the same connection to a Spotify stream? Probably not. So in the years since the invention of Bitcoin, the technology has been applied to all sorts of things, including dollars and even more recently digital art with things like NFTs. And this best of both worlds concept enables some interesting concepts. Because with digital art, you can actually separate the scarcity of ownership from the scarcity of consumption. And what I mean by that is this is a famous painting by um, da Vinci, one of the most expensive paintings ever sold. Some years ago, somebody paid $500 million for it, and nobody has seen it since because the, the owner decided to just put it in a vault somewhere. This is one of the most expensive NFTs ever sold from an artist called Beeple. A couple years ago, this sold for something like $70 million. And while the owner has the token, the NFT, locked up in a vault somewhere, I'm sure, the art itself is everywhere. In fact, the auction house that sold it put an ultra-high resolution version of this file on their website for the world to enjoy just to promote the sale. And digital art enables other cool features like the fact that you can program the token that every time it's sold to somebody else, a royalty goes to the original artist. And that's the kind of thing that you would think a lot of artists would be super excited about. But you'd be surprised how many artists I meet who when they learn that I am into crypto, they're like, oh, I hate NFTs. And I'm not surprised um, based on what they're telling me because I've been hearing some version of the same thing from people who work in you know, big tech or banking for a decade now. And some of them are just scared of change, or just because if you're good with physical art doesn't mean you're going to succeed with digital art. But I think most of them are actually stuck in a story. And it's the story that like, if the world goes online, that it can only go online if it's, a, if it's in the hands of a handful of large corporations, big tech and big banks. And even though the negative consequences of that become more apparent with every passing year, there's nothing we can do about it. Well, except maybe we can empower big government to try to regulate it. Right? Crypto represents a very different story. But the people who believe this, they're so stuck in it that they don't even think we have a problem. In fact, one of the most common critiques you will hear about blockchain or crypto is that it is a solution looking for a problem. Yeah, you've heard this. And I love every time somebody says this, because it reminds me of one of my favorite allegories, uh, which was told by the late great novelist David Foster Wallace in a very famous commencement speech that he once gave. And in it, he tells the story of two young fish who are swimming along when they come across an older fish. And the older fish says, morning kids, how's the water? And the young fish say, good morning back and keep swimming. Then one of them turns to the other one and says, what the hell is water? Water is the story of the world being one way. Right? And what I represent, but also the ideas that many of you represent, is a story of the world being different. But it's a very hard thing to digest because it requires letting go. And it also requires perhaps a lengthy period of muddling. So since my original Bitcoin epiphany 10 years ago, I have been wrong about a lot of things. But the thing I've been the most wrong about was how messy this was all going to be. I did not see all of this coming. And this is the stuff that you've all heard about. Sam Bankman fried the FTX, the frauds, the greed, the collapses, the coins crashing, people going to jail. But in retrospect, I should have known. Because this is the crypto world's version of muddling and trying to figure its way out. And there's a lot of precedence for this kind of thing, actually. 
um, historically, there's been a tendency for major technological revolutions to have bubbles and collapses associated with them. So this right here, these are railroad stocks in the 1800s. There was a huge railroad bubble. These are the, this is the price chart of internet stocks in the 1990s. And if you, you know, superimpose the chart of Bitcoin on them, um, it would look very similar. And this is sort of like part of the chaos, chaotic process of change. And whenever I see charts like this, it reminds me of something that I myself drew a long time ago, which was a little graphic that I would share with my personal training clients. So I used to make them all sign a contract with me, not a financial one, but a commitment to sticking to the long-term plan of what we were working on together. And inside that contract was this little cartoon I made about progress. And I told them, look, this is how you think progress is going to go. You put in the time and the effort, it's linear. And this is how progress actually goes. And inevitably, all of them would say, wait a minute, you're going to tell me I'm going to pay you all this money and have all these training sessions and diet, and at some point, I'm going to be worse off? <laughs> and I would tell them, no. But there's definitely going to be a moment where you feel like you're worse off. And the most important thing when that happens, if you see it coming, is to just keep on muddling, because right? the change will happen. So what I realize now is that what crypto is going through <coughs> is this. And this is, in part, necessary. And that's why I am, in some ways, more confident than I have ever been, especially since the kind of change that I represent and I believe in is, brilliantly enough, the only change that nobody ever saw coming. So if you take every other major tech thing that's happening in the world today, right? Smartphones, robots, drones, artificial intelligence that becomes evil and tries to kill us all. <laughs> all you have to do is go back 50 years and read science fiction. Every single one of those things was predicted, right? But nobody ever predicted a new way of creating value. Right, new business models for artists. These are not the kind of things that people were thinking about. And even if you go back to the, you know, there was a railroad bubble. Well, OK, railroads change how we move people and goods, and that was important. There was an internet bubble. The internet changed how we move data, and that's important. Right, but crypto changes how we move value. And because the goal is to take back control and give it to people and communities, then that can't happen until we change our values. And this was always going to be a messy process. But then, as we've been hearing from the other speakers, if you're talking about personal change or societal change, right, the more ambitious you are, the messier that it's going to be. But there's nothing left to do but embrace it. So in conclusion, First of all, since we're on, we are in the UK, and I did bring my rock and roll CD, I'm going to unveil my t-shirt and recommend to, <laughs> never mind the bollocks, here comes the blockchain. But more importantly, as, as we've all been talking about, um, the change part is inevitable. The part you can't control is how chaotic that progress change could be. But if you embrace that, then good things are bound to come. Thank you very much.